All right, everybody, for abusing bleeding edge web standards for AppSec Glory, we got Bryant Zadigan and Ryan Lester. Please give them a big hand. Uh, all right, so everyone, please take a moment and visit our website. <clears throat> I, I know it looks scary, but trust me, um, <clears throat> it's uh, part of the hands on component of our session. So. so so actually, hold on for a second, Ryan, why did you go with this site? Well, the, the internet was all out of domains, I swear, this was the last one they had. So um, in the, something that we noticed in the course of setting this up, um, if you're using an Android phone, actually if you're using any phone at all, congratulations and on your bravery, uh, we applaud you. Um, but if you're using an Android phone uh, with the configuration on this domain for whatever reason, um, you might get an assert error. So all other phones seem not to have a problem with it. So. There you go. In case you decide not to take the risk, this is what you'll see. So, moving on. <laughs> that was much better reception than Black Hat. They didn't get the joke at all. Um, anyway, so welcome to Abusing Bleeding Edge Web Standards for AppSec Glory. Uh, my name is Bryant, uh, and I'm Brian. And that's Ryan. Uh, we're not used oh, to. Sorry, I forgot to. Right, we're not used to these mics. We're well, still adjusting from lapel mics. If you didn't hear, I'm Ryan. <laughs> so, just some background on me. Uh, I do a lot of AppSec related stuff. Uh, I mentor security startups sometimes. Uh, I also mentor others, mentor in air quotes, others on application security on occasion. Once upon a time, I paid a friend a dollar to make Steve Ballmer dance on stage, but just once. And I'm uh, the CEO of an end-to-end -end encrypted communication startup called Syf, uh, which is actually the origin of a lot of the research that went into this talk. I'm also more or less the chief architect and primary developer of Syf. Uh, before Syf, I was a software engineer at a rocket factory called SpaceX. And at one point, I was sued by Napster for alleged trademark infringement. Are you allowed to talk about that? Uh, not in detail, no. Okay. Um, Okay, we'll just leave it at that then. Settlement, classic stuff. Fair enough. So in talking about bleeding edge web standards, I want to kind of clarify some of, like, one of the key words here. You'll notice the first word in the title of the talk is abusing. Most people hear the word abusing and they assume hacking in a very, like, breakery way. But we're speaking not just in terms of hacking and, like, classical hacking that you and I might be used to, but also hacking from, like, a developer standpoint. So coming up with novel solutions to problems that, you know, are completely unanticipated and what have you. So very much like developer hacking, dev hacking, um, as well as classical hacking that many breakers in this room might be used to. So we're going to focus on three web standards that you guys hopefully know about, but I'll do, like, a show of hands as we're going along uh, just to see how we are. Um, let's see. So first of all, we've got sub-resource integrity. Show of, a quick show of hands as to who in the room who's familiar with browser-side standards might know what SRI is. Hey, not bad. Uh, so we're going to talk about specifically something that we're calling SRI fallback. Uh, you can probably anticipate what that means. Uh, we'll go through it as we're walking through it. So we're also going to touch on content security policy. Uh, show of hands. Ah, nice. Okay, that's good. So. We're going to talk about something that we're calling CSP meta hardening here. So we're not really going to teach anybody what content security policy is, uh, but we will talk about how you can use it in some edge cases that a number of startups might be encountering, things like that. And this last one is probably going to be about a half of the talk. Um, so we're focusing on HTTP public key pinning. Show of hands. Awesome. Now, the thing that we're going to focus on here is something that we're calling HPKP suicide. So, why? Now, <laughs> here's the thing. Uh, new standards are being drafted left and right. And if anybody's been keeping track of the creation of, of web standards, like browser side standards, things like that, you'll notice that the pace has kind of seen a bit of an uptick. Uh, there are quite a few standards that most people don't actually know about. Uh, has anybody heard of CAA? There's a hand back there. There's like three hands in the whole room for a live standard in production that's currently being widely used. Okay. So now that we've established that, um, it's not just the standards that are being created at a rapid pace that are creating unforeseen complications. 
Uh, it's also that the implementations, which are, you know, happening rapidly, uh, these implementations, because of the pace at which they're being developed, can be a bit screwy. So, when you start messing around with standards, and especially obscure specs in said standards, obscure use cases, uh, you can probably find extremely novel ways of using these standards, or extremely novel ways of breaking them. I mean, in the course of this talk, Ryan and I found, we, we hit, what, two bounties on, on Chrome just completely by accident. We didn't create a fuzzer or anything. We just scored a quick 2500 bucks just in the course of making this talk. So kind of diving into SRI, now we're actually going to get into the meat of it. Um, a lot of this stuff should actually be pretty easy to use. It's once we get to HPKP that things become a bit risky for everybody. So. Sure. Uh, yeah, so SRI, sub resource integrity, it's one of the standards Bryant was just discussing. Uh, it's just a way for you to assure the integrity of resources hosted outside of your zone of trust. Uh, in, in the example here, we've got jQuery gloated from their CDN. Uh, we would also be using a fallback source if uh, the spec actually provided something like that. So they, they mention the possibility and kind of give general guidance on how you might implement it yourself, but they don't give you a direct way that you can just use it out of the box. So we decided to implement it for you. <coughs> We have a script called fallback SRC. Uh, that's what we call it, right? Um, well, anyway, fallback uh, source script. You just add this X SRI fallback attribute to any of your scripts or style sheets. And in the event that the primary source fails to validate, the, uh, the new one will be injected and validated against the same hashes. So we've got a. Cool. Quick, sorry? I think we're actually skipping this demo, are we? Oh, yeah, yeah. We're skipping this one for the sake of time, but it's there if you want to see it. And that's the source code. So we'll also have at the very end, on the very last slide, we're going to have one link that aggregates all the links that we're going to put on screen today. So if you don't want to have to worry about catching the pictures in time, don't worry about it. Wait until the last slide, take a picture of that, and you'll get everything. So, but while we're here, we will just very quickly show about the quick two grand that we knocked off of Chrome uh, when we were in the midst of creating the talk. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I mentioned very early on that you can actually in the course of testing novel web standards that were just introduced uh, or like very recently introduced or what have you, maybe there wasn't enough time for testing, whichever. Uh, you can in the course of testing them out uh, very quickly score some quick and easy cash. And the one we're going to talk about here is a case where if somebody um, manages to hack around with SRI in a same origin use case, um, in an older version of Chrome you actually could have gotten a script to run the second time around. And I'll let Ryan kind of take on the pre scripted demo. Sure. Uh, so, like Brian said, we found this by accident. This was supposed to be the demo that we were going to use uh, for an early version of this talk, uh, just demoing SRI. By, by the way, um, for people that think we can't read it, we're actually going to zoom in on the key parts as we go through. Right. So. Uh, so, we've got uh, just two buttons here one that injects a script with a valid hash, one that does invalid. Clicking the invalid hash, uh, you can see there's an SRI error there, as expected. So loading the script failed. Then you click the button a second time and it works when it shouldn't. So let's see, that one, if you wanted a quick use case for how you could have exploited that flaw, well if you happen to actually compromise a site, especially one that has like infinite page loads and it would be constantly reloading the same script or maybe like the same XSS payload, that would be one potential area where you could exploit that. So Google ended up marking that one as a high and, and giving a quick $2,000 payout. So now that one having been discussed, we've talked about SRI, we've kind of showed off the script and how you can implement a fallback in the event that you want to have some way of loading backup content in the event that your main, tr your main resource that you're loading off site can't load. Now that we've talked about that, let's move on to CSP and how you can combine some interesting properties in CSP to do novel things. So we've got something that we're calling CSP meta hardening. Um, and what this is, is you're combining a semi strict header. What this means is that it's a header that's, it doesn't have all the rules you want defined, but it has, like it has a lot of leeway for you to do things that might otherwise be considered dangerous. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to load trusted complex logic. Uh, that being said, this trick that we're going to show, because it relies on meta headers, there are some verbs that don't work. Uh, frame ancestors, report URI, or sandbox, they, they won't work in meta headers. There are others as well, um, but we'll get into them in a bit. We do, I believe, 
uh, have, yeah, we do have a demo for this, also pre-scripted, but again, if you visit the URLs, you can see these demos in practice and see how they actually work. Just right click DevTools um, and actually watch, uh, watch how it works in the console, watch what elements are introduced, things like that. So, and I'll let Ryan take this one on. Sure. Uh, so it's the same general format as the UI of the previous demo. We've got three buttons here and it shows the current content security policy. So running inline code should work because we have unsafe inline and you can see it did. Non inline code or code from the current origin, that also works. And then we have a third button to harden CSP via meta element. So when you click that, it, it actually injects into the DOM uh, an HTTP equivalent meta header with a uh, more restricted CSP. So you can see now unsafe inline is no longer in the CSP. And now running uh, inline code will generate a CSP error. And we'll get into some considerations as well, but we're going to talk about the, we'll, we'll get into some considerations as you're setting this up for your own sites. Um, and we'll also talk about potential use cases. But first of all, if you want to use this, um, if you want to actually use this for your own sites, let's say you've got, let's say you've put in a lot of development effort into like an MVP. You're like your typical Silicon Valley shop. You've put in a lot of development effort and security maybe wasn't at the front of your mind um, and you want to implement this. Well, let's say you're doing your typical like single page app. Um, these are some considerations to make this work perfectly. Otherwise, there are some attacks that could work against this that would defeat your entire use of CSP in the first place. Uh, so when we say static content only, that means that if the initial response, if everybody in this room I hope is familiar with reflected XSS, if your initial response from the web server actually contains reflected content from the user in the initial request, then you're going to have that content execute during your relaxed content security policies, which defeats the point. Um, there is another potential attack we can go through after the talk just for the sake of time. Um, we'll say blindly trust us when we say include this header uh, in, your, in your headers that you're sending to the browser, uh, the X XSS protection uh, blocking mode. You definitely want this because there are some novel attacks that would work if you don't include this but implement meta hardening in the first place. So in terms of use cases, so I mentioned that if you have a semi, -re like let's say a semi recent application, you put a lot of time into implementing this and you haven't really taken security into account. Well, if you think about your typical really complex single page applications, I mean anything, I think wh what, the, like Google Apps, I'm, I'm just winging it at this point based on the UIs, but any application that does a lot of preloading of content, like Angular based apps, things of this sort, um, this is where this can work really well for you. But that being said, it should be used as a stopgap towards getting full CSP on your site. Uh, reason being, so long as you have relaxed CSP headers, you run the risk of anybody being able to get content that you haven't authorized to execute before you harden your headers with the meta tags. So this is the idea. Your application's static content loads first and in loading first while you have the relaxed headers, it's all the content that you trust, your application does, its, does all of its preloading into the DOM and it gets set. Um, once it's done being set up, at that point you then inject the meta headers into the DOM and then the browser takes up those rules hardens your content security policy and then you can start taking in dynamic content from be it other web servers or what have you. Uh, you can only do this one way. You can't relax headers. You cannot relax policies this way. You can only strengthen them. So you cannot introduce meta headers that then relax content security policy down the road. So now we get to like the meat of the talk. This is actually where all the cool stuff happens. So anybody that's looking for really breakery stuff, we've got a good chunk of stuff at the end that might excite some of you. So let's talk about HPKP. So for those of you that might not be familiar with HPKP, uh, we have it color coded in red because if you do it wrong, you will brick your site. And you will brick your site for up to 60 days uh, for, for users that are using your site assuming you actually set it up incorrectly. Uh, so we have a sample header set here, uh, like a sample uh, pin set here for you uh, where if you were to implement HPKP, uh, it would be in report only, it wouldn't, it wouldn't break anything if, if you end up doing it wrong uh, and, and it will have the max age configured perfectly. You just need to replace the, the keys for your hashes. Uh, well, the, the hashes for your keys 
uh, with the actual hashes for the keys that you're serving up. So my recommendation is if you implement this, you want to serve up all the hashes for all the keys you're using across all domains and subdomains. That's what the include subdomains uh, keyword is there for as well. This is probably the safest way to get started and then once you've had it in place for a while, then you can drop off the report only uh, and, and it's essentially like hard mode. So if something goes wrong at that point, then that's when people get locked out. So when we talk about HPKP suicide, well, what do we mean? So here's the thing. In a nutshell, you're deliberately self-bricking your users. That's what we're talking about here. In the spec itself, nobody's ever actually considered the possibility of deliberately bricking your users to enable new functionality. And that's what we're going to talk about over the next, what, 20-ish minutes? So we've got some ideas. Uh, there's the possibility of enabling in-browser code signing, but we'll explain why we scratch this out in a moment. We'll also follow that up with a solution that works almost as well uh, by controlling content changes and also hardening SRI. We'll also talk about nuanced web content blocking. So if you're familiar with your typical web content gateways like your nanny filters, things like that that would be in like high schools or, or corporations that like, you know, making sure that you don't have malware end up on your clients, there are ways that HPKP can be used to further that work. And the Black Hat audience was very, very receptive to this. It was really interesting. I'm pretty sure half of this room will probably hate that. You can also use this to track users. This can probably scare you. And we'll also talk about how you can use this to be total jerks in ways that we shouldn't really put in print. And before we continue, I wanted to give a shout out to Jan Horn at Cure53. Uh, he was actually the one who put us on to this idea during the course of an audit of Scythe uh, last year. And DigiCert as well, actually, before Let's Encrypt existed to make this idea easier to implement, uh, worked with us on making it possible in, in Scythe. Uh, so here we've got an HPKP suicide-based local content pinning scheme, uh, which intentionally self-bricks your own website to pin an app cache or service worker uh, persistently in the browser with the same lev level of security guarantee that HPKP provides. Uh, so first, the user is just visiting your website like normal, and it's setting an app cache or a service worker. Then on the back end, the server is actually deleting its own TLS private key, generating an entirely new key pair, and uh, requesting a new certificate from, the, from its CA. And then, of course, changing the HPKP headers to compensate for that. And then the next time the user hits that site, uh, the TLS handshake will fail, and it will be to the browser as though the site the server is literally offline, push, uh, forcing it to fall back on the, the cached service worker. So let me put that in human terms. <laughs> if, because this is perfectly understandable for anybody that's familiar with sequence, with actual sequence diagrams, right? But the basic idea here is this. You're using HPKP suicide to deny your end users access back to the web server after they've already cached some sort of document from that server. And in denying access back to the web server on future visits, it's the document that you cached that's then loaded. Because every subsequent connection back to the web server has to kind of go through that service worker first because that's, it's, it's been stored in the browser, right? So it goes through that service worker first which can then handle the error in the event that the connection fails. But in this case, the service worker is deliberately anticipating the connection to fail because the keys will mismatch. And therefore, that's where you can embed the extra logic for how, to, for how your application actually wants to run, such as loading resources from other subdomains that haven't been pinned within the actual service worker itself. That's the key here, and that's, how this, that's, that's essentially how this entire scheme works. And it's enabled by the fact that you're rotating the keys on a very rapid cadence. That way you're actually deliberately locking people out as time goes on. So we've actually got a really novel use case here and Ryan's gonna talk about it. Yeah, uh, so we, uh, in the slide earlier you saw we had code signing as a possible application of this crossed out. Uh, so, I mean, why not? Um, in theory you could use this local content pinning scheme to pin your code signing logic. Um, <coughs> Did it just skip the whole slide? Yeah, you skip the last slide. Ah. Go for it. All right, sorry. Uh, so yeah, in theory, that should work, more or less getting you trust on first use. And um, so why, in theory, it sounds like it should work. 
In fact, SIF employs a mature audited implementation of exactly this that we call WebSign. Uh, however, it was considered novel enough that we were advised to apply for a patent on it, uh, purely defensively, but um, no one else can do it now. <laughs> Uh, but you can come pretty close to the benefits of code signing by following uh, the scheme Brian is about to describe. Right. So you'll probably get to about 85-ish percent effectiveness of what, like, the code signing scheme that Ryan just talked about, if you combine HPKP with sub-resource integrity. And the uh, the basic thinking here is this: in that service worker that you've got that you pin in the browser, every reference to every other resource on other domains is going to have your integrity checks through SRI, right? Now, in order to make this work, since you're locking users away from accessing the content, what you need to do is you need to have the max age, the actual counter that says how long this header is valid for, dynamically count down to whenever you routinely deploy a new application into production. So let's say you deploy a new app, like a new version into prod, let's say Sunday at 4.20 p.m., right? In that case, what you're going to have is you have the actual max age counting down to that date and every time a person visits the max age is going to be different for all of them but that being said it doesn't make a difference. When their, mag when their HPKP headers expire they pull down any new content, any new hashes for scripts that are off site, things of that sort. Uh, and as a result because the other scripts are being checked against the hashes that you've stored you're still, I mean it's not really the same as code signing but it gets you pretty close and, and, and the reasoning here is that they, no attacker can replace the initial content, the initial service worker that you've pinned in the browser. They can't replace that because when the browser then tries to connect again to the site, it's the connection is going to bomb out. Now of course the only way this will work is if you're rotating the keys let's say once every, what is the cadence on let's encrypt like 20 times a week? So it's like once every 8-ish hours maybe? 8.4 hours? 8.4, something like that. Um, so you're rekeying once every 8.4-ish hours and that means if a, if a user visits within the first 8, like visits and then visits again like 9 hours later, that connection bombs out. That content that, they, that was pinned, the service worker, can then never be updated until those headers expire. Now what are you looking at in terms of benefits? You're retaining control of front end content between releases. Right? So that means that in the event that let's say your, your main web server gets, con your content servers get compromised, be it the ones that have the SRI protected content or the ones serving that initial page, the service worker, it doesn't matter because the people that are visiting your site uh, will have already pinned the content locally. Uh, and this also means that you're mitigating the risk of somebody like, you know, tampering hashes as a part of a much broader attack against your content that, m that might rely on resources that might have also been compromised in domains that you don't control. So you get some pretty decent security and performance gains, but there's a catch. Uh, HPKP suicide and SRI, it's a bit of a design time decision. This isn't, as far as we can tell, going to work with anything other than a single page app. Single page app, of course, like I mentioned earlier, being the kind of app that loads everything up front and then dynamically loads everything through web service calls. Here's the thing, you also need to include mitigations like halting the distribution of HPKP headers if your site's compromised. Well why? Because if your site gets popped, then now you're serving and pinning malicious content into the, your, into your user's browsers. So you need to be careful about making sure that your content, if you see evidence of tampering, isn't actually going to serve back the HPKP headers that pin that content in your browser, uh, in your user's browsers. So, Time permitting, we'll actually go ahead and check out a demo on a site, what, redskins.io. We're both from DC. That's kind of the, kind of the gag there. It's not completely random. Yeah, it's not completely random. There is actually some, some sort of an inside joke there. Now, we'll take this one a bit further. Let's say that you've got a web content gateway, like Bluecoat, right? I, I love picking on Bluecoat because I've only ever had to deal with them. So, here's what they can do. They could actually, any web content gateway that implements HPKP, because they're already intercepting connections, like they've, okay, they've got SSL man in the middle, like TLS man in the middle, they're already seeing all your traffic, your, your, your banking transactions, your mail, whatever, right? That's part of the design. Uh, they can actually lock users out of malicious sites or flagged sites or porn sites or whatever, uh, even when they're not, even when your users are not on the network. Like, let's say they're using a corporate laptop, 
they try visiting, I, I don't know, what's a good, xhamster.com, sure. Uh, and, the, and Blue Coat says, oh, wait a second, this is obviously a porn site, we're gonna keep you from visiting this. Well, here's the thing, for that flag domain, it sets the HPKP header for the Blue Coat cert, right? Now think about this for a second. It's the Blue Coat cert. It's not gonna be available on the public internet, but that cert was just pinned for that site. So now you take your corporate laptop off of the corporate network and you still can't visit the site. Now if you're a technical user you can of course blow those pins away but you know, I don't think your average accountant really knows how to do that. So now optionally if, if for whatever reason you can't afford blue coat like multiple instances for your own network, okay you can rotate the keys weekly at the gateway as well. Um, but I figure if you are considering using blue coat you can afford the, the licensing fees for them. So Hopefully by us disclosing it, this makes it prior art, which means that nobody can actually patent this and make filthy money off of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> wait a second. Uh, so apparently Blue Coat is uh, now an intermediate certificate authority, so we don't actually know how relevant this is to any part of our talk. Um, it might not be because the cert path is actually zero, um, but you know, do with that knowledge what you will. We're kind of hoping somebody can go break around and see what they can do. So, oh, oh, this one's fun. This one's fun. Okay, user tracking. So we shouldn't really talk about this, uh, but you know, since this is DEF CON, let's track users. So here's what we need. This is, by the way, a very buildery talk, but because it's kind of sort of tiptoeing on like the edges of ethics, we'll call it breakery as well. Uh, so you need to pin a lot of subdomains. We're talking like 32 subdomains. That number probably sounds, it makes sense if you think about it. You also need browsers that pin, well that, ha that respect HPKP incognito. And finally you need that ability to do rapid key rotation, to rekey on a routine cadence because you need to be able to lock users out, right? So actually I gotta go back for a second. So we actually need to thank Let's Encrypt for this. And again, we love, I, there might actually be some Let's Encrypt guys in the room, so come on, clap. <laughs> Let's Encrypt is intru has introduced a lot of nov, like just by automating everything, they've it allowed us to do a lot of novel things. Um, we might have some amount of issue with some of the things we've been able to achieve, uh, but at the same time we understand and love the vision for spreading TLS all over the open web. So t in this case Let's Encrypt really helped out uh, just by virtue of the fact that you can rekey on a very rapid basis and because it's free and because it's automated and very very easy. So uh, I'll let Ryan kind of talk about some of the configuration stuff. It's not really going to make all that much sense until you see Ryan's demo. Right, so this will be, this explanation will be a little hand wavy and that's by design. Uh, it'll make a lot of sense when you see the demo. So on your server, you've got uh, an HPKP server with uh, all of your subdomains, uh, star dot whatever domain pointing at the same server. You've got a set method that returns an HPKP header and a check method that does nothing, it's a no op, and um, you're just routine, routinely rotating your keys on that server. Then on your uh, JavaScript, to set a new ID, you're just hitting those subdomains in a random pattern, uh, hitting set on them. And to check the ID, you're iterating through all of them and hitting the check method on all of them. So in principle, it's pretty similar to the HSTS super cookie that I think Sammy Kamkar uh, came up with? Or? Yeah. Okay. I think so. Hopefully. Don't quote me on that. So we've got a demo uh, super cookie server set up at scythe.wang and um, just went, went through a quick demo, sorry quick demo here in, in our JS console in Google. So Google did not implement this, we pasted in our JavaScript into their console. So you just run the super cookie uh, JS right there and uh, it'll, here you can see it generated a new ID, it's just a, just a random 32 bit integer 4565566. Five, six. And now we're trying again in an incognito window on a totally different site. And in this case, um, it, you can see a bunch of failed TLS handshakes uh, from those, uh, what? From those HPKP, sui HPKP suicides, and it re reconstructed the exact same ID there, 4565566. If you look at the subdomains, you can see it's just a bunch of numbers.syfe.wang. We're using 0 through 31.syfe.wang, 
uh, just as like bits in a 32-bit integer. So we're literally iter iterating through all of them in a for loop. So what you just saw was a way to track whether or not a user has hit your site in incognito mode. In blatant violation of the fact that incognito or private modes are supposed to give you certain privacy guarantees. Uh, we've actually, I think, raised that up as a concern, but it's been just deemed as the, the, the security benefits of, H of both HSTS and HPKP have been deemed to be much more significant than, than the potential privacy loss of doing so. Um, I don't actually think either of us have a problem with HSTS in that capacity, but HPKP, uh, we personally think shouldn't actually be uh, necessarily respected in private modes or incognito modes. And in fact, uh, there was a time, I think, in Tor Browser, so this is our big PSA, right? Um, there was a time in Tor Browser a few versions ago, we don't know the exact version, but we did confirm it, I want to say like two hours before the talk, uh, that if you haven't updated Tor Browser yet, HPKP headers, we believe, can actually be set in incognito mode and respected in between sessions, which means theoretically you could, in older versions, be tracked across sites, assuming sites set this up. Um, we don't believe that's the case now. Uh, we double checked uh, and we believe that if it was actually an issue, so again, we're not 100% certain, if it was an issue, it's no longer an issue now. So if you are using Tor Browser, please upgrade to the latest version. So, thank you. Now, you have some risks. Let's say if you want to implement this, uh, you have the risk of somebody else saying, well, hey, this is actually kind of unethical. So we're going to try and DOS your tracking domains as a public service, right? We agree this is actually pretty shady. Like the, the actual implementation of a super cookie like this is actually pretty shady. So if you really want to implement this, uh, you can always whitelist domains that you want to track, you know, for your own tracking service. But if you're going to offer this as like a sold service, uh, you can always just, you know, issue a nonce back, you know, uh, a nonce through a back channel to the app that's then serving up the super cookie itself to your users. That nonce is then sent back in from your actual clients back into the tracking domains itself. And then your domains can say, hey, wait a second, I've, I do expect this nonce. Let me go ahead and serve up the HPKP headers themselves. So there you go, some quick mitigations for issues that some people might say, hey, well, wait a second, you know, I can kind of stop this service from working right now. So. This pattern is also similar to others that are actually actively discussed in the RFC. The only catch here is that in the RFC, a lot of the super cookie ideas rely on the report URI construct, which, as, which again isn't supported in Firefox. So it's not as effective. Whereas this one, yeah, it, it won't work if you use NoScript. Hopefully a lot of people do. Um, but it will work against a lot of your average users who don't even know what NoScript is. So we do have the source for it. Um, you can, of course, go and check it out. Uh, up there, or you can grab it again off of the aggregate link. All right, this is the fun part. We got what, like 12, 13 minutes left? So, what if you want to be like a total jerk? That's like, what, half the room? One person clapped. One person, I heard it. Um, so, we really shouldn't talk about this. But, you know, who are we kidding? This is DEF CON. So, here's what you need to make what we're about to talk about work. And we're not going to give you a novel way to break into a site. We're not giving an exploit. There's, again, no exploit here, no, no unpublished full disclosure thing. The last talk, we had this whole lecture on responsible disclosure. Please follow it, please. Uh, but that being said, this is a nice attack pattern, and that's kind of the fun we're about to have. So here's what you need. You need a high traffic target. I, I can think of many media organizations that might be covering the elections as a good example. Uh, you need a way to shell the box and you need a free CA. Right. So, and again, okay, we, we love Let's Encrypt. Again, I know there's some people in here. We love them. Give them another hand, round of applause, please. Again, just repeat it. Awesome. The absolute worst possible thing you can do with this, as Ryan and I have determined, is what we're calling, it, like, is taking a site for ransom. And we'll explain why in a bit. So we're, we decided to call this pattern ransom PKP, you know, in the culture of arbitrarily naming your attack patterns and vulnerabilities, right? Uh, so what you got to do is you have to de determine your target first. You have to generate what we're calling a ransom key pair. So this is, you know, just, this is the key, this is the key pair that you're holding within your control. You're not giving away even the public key. You're just maintaining this. Oh, people still use pwn in hacker lingo today, right? I hope so. Okay. So you have to pwn the target web server. Oh, God, I just said that out loud. Uh, 
you have to, uh, once you've actually taken control of the web server, on the server, using certbot or whatever you want to use, your own automated script, doesn't really matter, uh, generate your, generate an actual what we're calling lockout key pair. This is a disposable key pair. It's by design for it to be disposed. Then send off the CSR and you get your actual cert back and you mount the cert. Then there's something else and a question mark. Uh, are we allowed to use that graphic? I think we are. Uh, and some profit, we hope. So what's in the box? So while owned users is less than n, in other words, while you have yet to reach a certain number of users that you've predetermined based on the size of the site that you're trying to hit, what you're going to try and do is, you know what, I'm not all that good at explaining it. I'm just going to let Ryan do it. That's fine. Um, let's see. So, uh, yeah, I mean, in the box, uh, while owned users is uh, less than n, or just on some static interval like 8.4 hours we mentioned with Let's Encrypt, uh, it's acting up. Okay, there we go. Your, your laptop's probably already gotten owned. Oh. <laughs> um, please don't own my laptop. Um, so, uh, on that interval or after each of those n users, you just um, rekey that you generate a new uh, lockout key, you delete the current one, generate a new one, and throw it in the HPKP header while the ransom uh, key, public key hash, is still in there. Is it? Yeah, just Perfect. go with that. All right. Um, and then each time, uh, like I said, you blow out the old key port, meh, blow out the old key pair, generate a new one, this locks out n users, however many users hit that site uh, during that interval. And um, that's pretty much it. So the idea is that you would go beyond simple defacement of a website and you would actually potentially monetize it. Did you want to rekey the site now? Uh, it's already, no, I already set up a timer, so. Oh, so this might actually work. Hold on, so let's actually, let's actually see if we're going to be uh, dinged by the demo gods here. All right, so uh, anyone who went to isis.io at the beginning of our, uh, our talk, uh, this is what you probably saw or should have seen unless you were on Android, as Bryant mentioned. And uh, now that a rekey has occurred, this is what you should see, Here's a TLS key pinning error. So let's actually call this out. If you actually look, uh, we can't zoom into this one, but if you actually look, the specific error should say pinned key not insert chain, assuming that it, the key is actually rotated on time. So. Essentially what we did here, let me clarify how this attack really works. You're holding the access of the users of the site hostage. That's the idea. You're denying access to the many users of the site and you're basically saying, look, we'll give you the ransom key pair. Well, well yeah, actually, we will give you literally the ransom key pair if you, for instance, do whatever we want you to do. Uh, that's, that's essentially the premise here. Now somebody could, that's the worst possible thing we've thought of that somebody could do. Um, if you gain access to a box, uh, then you can do quite a lot of things, uh, but let's say all you get access to is just the web server, right? Like, okay, typical site defacement is probably on your roadmap. You're probably going to put, I don't know, uh, uh, owned by some hackery name. Uh, but why do that when you can also monetize what you just did, right? So that's essentially what we're concerned about here is now you've got HPKP and not just Let's Encrypt but other CAs that are going to follow that model down the road that could enable this attack pattern. So we have some considerations to think about though, like meaning why this isn't a high severity issue. So here's the thing, Let's Encrypt's rate limit is 20 certs a week. We mentioned this earlier. Uh, it's, it's kind of an artifact of how they've architected the service. Originally it was like a five rekey limit, but if you reconfigure that cert package that you send for like the actual key, uh, to get the actual cert, you can get it to be 20 for every single given domain. Uh, so given that, you can't actually rotate the key like every minute. Uh, you, you're still bound to some constraint. Uh, Chrome and Firefox also have HPKP lockout mitigations. Uh, notably, both parties have or are in the midst of reducing the max age, as I mentioned earlier, down from one year to 60 days. Chrome originally reduced it because people were bricking themselves left and right implementing HPKP and were bricking access to their users to the site for like a year at a time. And these, of course these guys have no idea how to clear their key pins so they figured, you know what, two months is probably a lot more palatable. And finally, you still need to actually compromise the box. So 
ultimately the, the conclusion by the teams was pretty much like this. Uh, Chromium, they've indicated they won't fix it, they'll still keep an eye out, but they won't make any other programmatic changes because they've already reduced the max age to 60 days, which is fine. Uh, Firefox, they've gone ahead and reduced the max age and I think that that's on its way to production right now. And Let's Encrypt has indicated that they won't fix because they believe it's out of scope. Uh, we actually understand this reasoning here. The idea here being that spreading TLS is much more important than worrying about what could potentially be an experimental risk. So we, we totally get it. Now that being said, that puts the onus on all the rest of us for ways to address this. Just as a reminder to myself, how many people have heard of CAA? Right. That hasn't changed. Okay. So what is it? Uh, DNS certification authority authorization. Uh, it's kind of a mouthful. It's basically a blacklist whitelist. So it sounds messed up. Uh, if you have the DN, if you have in your DNS record uh, the, the CAA record, then every single CA that hits your domain in order to, you know, be able to confirm and make sure that it's authorized to give that domain a cert will say, oh, wait a second, it has a, it, it has the CAA record right? And it says I will now by default assume I cannot give you a certificate for this domain unless that CA has been whitelisted within the record. So in other words you're basically saying if you have this record for your domain you are permitting certain sites, sorry, sorry, certain CAs to give you the certificate for your site. So if you don't list Let's Encrypt or you don't list any other free CA then nobody can use a free CA or, or some other unknown CA to issue the certificates for your domain. Now, alternatively, you could also use HPKP. Uh, we actually had somebody who attended the Black Hat version of this talk who said that this isn't a complete mitigation, but it does buy you time in monitoring. Uh, so, if you monitor your headers for changes, uh, you, the only way somebody can attack you if you're already using HPKP is if they inject their own key into your headers and wait until the max age is expired before then dropping your key and beginning the attack. So, Lastly, you can also just try not to get popped, but that's like the hardest of them all. So, now what if you're an end user, like an accountant that might get, might be like a what bystander that gets uh, hit by this? Uh, you can always try visiting uh, Chrome Net Internals uh, HSTS, um, but alternatively, you can also clear. I believe they fixed this. Uh, this used to be a. This was also another vulnerability that we found. This is a quick 500 bucks. Uh, you can also clear. I believe your cache, um, and that should also clear your HPKP headers as well. Uh, originally, you could clear any aspect of your browsing history, including save passwords. And because they misplaced a curly brace, that would also clear your HPKP headers. So, yeah, that's what we mean when we say that a lot of these standards are implemented very quickly, and some of the testing isn't always complete. And in Firefox, if you dip into about config, cert pinning, enforcement level, and you set that to zero, you hit the site, take the new header, and then re enable, you should be fine. So I think, Ryan, you've got the source on, yeah. Yeah. And also, we just wanted to be clear for any law enforcement agencies in the room. Uh, we did not uh, implement or open source actual ransomware. This is just the, <laughs> the basic POC that implements the rekeying and the whole lockout process. It's like a DOS. Right. So yeah, you definitely need to put in a lot of extra effort to make this work. The, all that's here is just the technical details for how to rekey on a rapid cadence. Uh, we have a lot of hat tips. Um, I'll go ahead and just read all the names out. Um, crap, I should probably have remembered how to pronounce some of these names. Uh, Geller Bedoya, DigiCert, um, Twitter handle EL underscore D33, uh, John Callahan, Jan Horn at all of Cure53, uh, Sammy Kamkar, Jim Manico, Mike McBride, Jim Rennie and his superb legal skill. Uh, Garrett Robinson, John Willander, Doug Wilson, as well as the Chrome, Firefox, and Let's Encrypt security teams for all their contributions to this talk. This talk was something like five, six months in the making. And for those of you that didn't take pictures, there you go. That's the slide. Uh, take pictures. Uh, go and check out the demos. Uh, you can also check out a lot of this stuff. Um, I, my technical background here is I advise Ryan and, and his company, Syfe, on implementing a lot of the AppSec stuff that they have there. Uh, so if you want to see some of this stuff in action, you can always just check out Syfe.com or Syfe.im and see some of this stuff in production. So um, we actually have, for those of you not fleeing the room, if anybody has questions since we're the last talk of the day, I will gladly come and throw bags of popcorn at your face. 
questions can be asked here at the floor mic. I'm not kidding. This is really good popcorn. It's like homemade, not by me, but by some other guy that Microsoft purchased popcorn from. They just got way too much. Thank you, Microsoft. <laughs> 